session now officially starts. Hello. Uh, Let's welcome the moderator, Michael Jordan. Good afternoon, guests. I'm Michael Jordan. I'm the uh, moderator of this session and uh, chair of the uh, selection committee for the 2023 World Laureate uh, Association Prize. Uh, this is the WLA Laureates Roundtable. Um, it's not quite a roundtable, which is, uh, we've broken some symmetry here. Um, we are near a round lake, but uh, we don't have a round table. Um, so today, it should be a very interesting session. Uh, we have our two laureates, world leading experts in optimization theory, broadly speaking, which has spread over many, many nearby fields. Uh, I've argued uh, in the write-up about the two of them that optimization is arguably the most influential applied discipline in mathematics over the last 50 years. We could discuss that. Um, before we get going, though, let me provide an introduction to the prize itself. Uh, as you presumably all know, the WLA prize um, is an international science prize. It's established in Shanghai in 2021. It was initiated by the World Laureates Association, uh, of whom this building. It's managed by the WLA Foundation and exclusively fun funded by Sequoia China. Uh, the WLA Prize aims to recognize and support eminent researchers and technologists worldwide for their contributions to science. It is intended to support global science and technology advancement, address the challenges to humanity, and promote society's long-term progress. Each year, the WLA Prize is awarded in two categories, computer science or mathematics, and life science or medicine. The total award for each prize, which may be divided up among up to four laureates, is RMB 10 million. The 2023 prize for computer science or mathematics is awarded to Professor Arkady Nemirovsky, who is the John P. Hunter Chair Professor at the H. Milton Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology, and to Professor Yuri Nesterov, who's Professor Emeritus and Senior Scientific Researcher at the Center for Operations Research and Econometrics and Mathematical Engineering at the Université Catholique de Louvain. This award recognizes their groundbreaking contributions to convex optimization theory, including the theory of self-concordant functions and interior point methods, complexity theory of optimization, accelerated gradient algorithms, and methodological advances in robust optimization. So to begin, I'd like to invite our two laureates to briefly introduce themselves and their research areas and achievements. Each of you will have three minutes, and then we'll open it up to further discussion. So first, I'd like to start with Professor Arkady Nemirovsky. You need to use your microphone. Now it's okay? Yeah. So I was born in 1947 in Moscow. I graduated from Moscow State University, Mathematical and Mechanical Department. Uh, then I worked for some time in Industry Research Institute. Then, then I, in 1987, I started to work in Central Economic and Mathematical uh, Institute of Russian Academy of Sciences, where there were two events. I met with Yuri Nesterov, I met with my wife. Uh, then in 1993, I immigrated to Israel. I was professor at the Faculty of Industrial Engineering and Management at the Technion. And since 2005, I am in uh, Georgia Institute of Technology and School of Industrial and System Engineering. So my interests were in convex optimization and in what's called non-parametric statistics. And there were two different fields, but the uh, last 10 years, they latterly for me, then they converge, and uh, this is what I was doing for the last 10 years uh, with my colleagues. Uh, Statistical inferences via converse optimization. Something else I am supposed to tell? That's good stuff. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Nemirovsky. Let's uh, turn to Professor Yuri Nesterov. Again, a three-minute introduction. Mm, thank you very much. So my name is Yuri Nesterov. So after finishing Moscow State University in 1977, I started working in uh, Academy of Science of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, and I worked during 15 years in the Central Economical and Mathematical Institute of uh, Academy of Science. So after that, so I moved to Belgium, and I also work in a center where the economists and mathematicians, they should sit together and help each other to develop new theories. So this is the center of operation research and <coughs> econometrics, where I worked during 30 years. So, um, and this explains maybe my interest to, not only to uh, optimization theory, which is of course interesting by itself, but also to applications. So for me it is always interesting to find how all of that works in practice and why it is working in practice and uh, so to find new application field. So, I was lucky to have from the very beginning very strong PhD supervisor, so Boris Polik, who passed away so this year, and I also worked with Arkady Nemirovsky the first 10 years of my career, so therefore I'm very lucky with these collaborators and I got many feedback from all these people. So this is it. So now I am Professor Emeritus, but I hope that I still uh, will have a possibility to continue research. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nestrov. So let me briefly introduce the guests here on the table, and then we'll start, well, by lay out the rules of the discussion and, and move on. So let me start by introducing Professor Alessio Figali. Um, I think someone wants to take a picture, make sure that can happen. Uh, Professor Christopher Hakon, Professor Martin Hellman, Professor Raj Reddy, Professor Shule, and Professor Yu Changju. All right, so uh, we're going to start the panel discussion at this point uh, where we want to focus on the laureates and their work. Um, but we really want to have a wide-ranging conversation, so we're going to ad hoc uh, pose questions to the laureates, uh, see if we can extract some answers or some opinions. Of course, the rest of the panel is encouraged to engage in their own opinions at some point. We can go to a free-for-all. Um, let me just say I, I think that this topic of optimization is a nice central point to kind of keep our focus on. Uh, Professor Nesterov's talk earlier in the day focused on the history of optimization, starting back with energy principles and physics and Euler and, and you know, going through to, um, you know, the origins of, in Cauchy of, of the Decipus descent method and the slow progress in that field over many, many years. Uh, and he argued that uh, the computational method that we're seeing flourishing in our day in computational mathematics, computational engineering and so on, optimization provides one of the serious pillars, he argued really the pillar uh, for it, and what's unique about it, I think this may help orient some of the discussion among the mathematicians especially, is it has a role for time. That these algorithms have to run in a certain amount of time. If they run in much longer time, they're just not very useful. You know, it, it really is kind of a mathematics that recognizes the role for doing something in the world in a certain amount of time. And that is arguably new in science um, and even in engineering where often the, the, the goal was a stable structure of some kind and so time was kind of viewed as infinite. So that's new, and the argument is that optimization just ties very, very directly to that. We also have a representative of optimal control here, and optimization also ties to doing things in the world, um, not just observing the world and making models of the world. Uh, so that was just a little bit of hopeful context that will um, maybe help seed some of our discussion. Um, so anyway, let's open it up uh, and maybe just raise your hand and I'll turn to you. And the overall discussion is going to go up to about 100 minutes. Um, I will be a moderator and hopefully steer things in interesting ways. We also will leave time at some point for Q&A from the audience. So if you start to have questions, maybe uh, raise your hand at some point. But the latter part of this should sort of turn to the audience. Uh, so with that as background, I'm now just have, uh, I'd like to open it up for discussion. 
Um, maybe so, someone who's perhaps closest to the area of represent, uh, represented here, and uh, perhaps that's you, uh, Chang Jun, um, might want to start. You have to turn it on at the bottom if, you're, if your mic is not working. Hello? Yeah, yeah thanks for uh, Professor Jordan and as the chair of this session. And uh, I have a question for Professor Nesrov. Actually, I think this morning you have, when you gave your lecture this morning, you mentioned the, uh, the AI when it integrated into the research in optimization. And my question is, uh, how do you think AI will be uh, integrated into the study or the application of optimization theory and method? Will it give, uh, have some impact on the current research or, or it just can help uh, researchers in the area to 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 make the uh, research uh, go forward. The the power of AI. No, uh, actually, well, my understanding is that um, at this moment, so we have uh, quite uh, diverse theory, general theory of optimization, but uh, actually for application field, so we need to be more specific. So, which means that for each application field or for each science, if you want, so we need to uh, develop new methods, so which uh, really are based on the problem structure, the problem sense, and all things like that. So, from optimiza general optimization theory, so we can have some advices, some examples, successful examples, how to develop the algorithm. But still, there is a lot of specifics uh, which should be used in order to d develop really efficient algorithms. So the situation now is very interesting because, well, I, I was speaking about the, these revolutions which we had in the computer science. So, and because of this revolution, in particular with applications in internet or big data problems, we get problems which were unsolvable several years ago. Yes, so the size is so big that uh, the usual optimization method, they do not rule. But we know how to tune all these parameters and therefore so we can have um, hope for, for support. And I uh, was thinking about the, uh, the way um, uh, and how the optimization technique uh, can be used for uh, uh, artificial intelligence again. So for artificial intelligence, so the main uh, it is based on some computations, which means that uh, we need to give, have some guarantees. So how much time it is going to take? So one minute, so one week, or one year computation. We should know that in advance before we we uh, start even modeling. Therefore, uh, I think for optimization theory, there is a, lit, uh, a lot of possibilities for uh, development for m many, many particular uh, fields and uh, as a consequence to help uh, to, to, to increase the efficiency of artificial int intelligence. Thank you. Would you like to add anything, Professor Romsky? No? Um, perhaps as a one follow-on, and then I'll turn to Marty. Um, uh, you uh, refer to yourself as both a statistician and an optimization theorist, which is which is true. Uh, I'm a statistician, and I recognize your leading work in that. And you've felt that they've come together. Um, machine learning is often focused on prediction, and a lot of the non-parametric statistics is as well. But as we talk about time, it's not just how much time it might take an algorithm to run. But if you're trying to decide to make, make a decision in the world quickly, you have to gather statistical evidence. I'm going to make a medical decision when I'm ready to make that decision because there's enough evidence to do so. And so I wonder how much you also continue to see the statistical perspective informing the, the temporal aspect of, of optimization. Yeah. There were some results on sequential decision-making uh, based on converse optimization. Uh, on paper, it looks nice. How it would like, uh, will uh, work in the real world, this I don't know, because we do not have uh, problems which where we could test it. In simulation, it, it works okay. Is this, yeah, this is on. 
So my question, and I'll explain it after I ask it, uh, is was your work that your work in optimization that won you this prize, was it initially encouraged as a great idea, run with it, or was it derided, was it uh, discouraged as a foolish idea that won't go anywhere? And the reason I ask this question is my own work in cryptography that won me the Turing Prize, and when I've asked Nobel laureates, the vast majority all say it was originally uh, discouraged as crazy. And I don't know, maybe yours is different, but I'd be interested, because this is something that people need to know, that the best ideas often sound crazy ahead of time. Akadi, why don't you go first, and then Yuri, it's to both of you. Uh, okay, my specialization at the university was functional analysis, and uh, why I started to do optimization and uh, still continue to do it, it's more or less, how to say, it happens by itself. Uh, I was asked uh, what is the complexity of converse optimization, and I tried to answer this question. Uh, that this was the beginning of it. No, I, I don't know, as, uh, from my experience, the most important events in our life, you cannot predict them in advance, uh, otherwise life would be not interesting. For example, I definitely wouldn't predict that I'll be here today. Uh, okay, in this capacity in which I am here. So the, the, the same as there was uh, selection of uh, optimization. Well, for me, it was not really a question because I started to do optimization in the, the university. So my master thesis was was already about optimization, and uh, so I started to work in Academy of Science, also in the laboratory which was doing optimization. But uh, what was important for me is to choose, let me say, somehow the style, so how I'm doing optimization, how much you are doing research and how much you are doing the numerical experiments and so on. And for me, initially, I was interested, of course, in theoretical uh, style, but it appears that the laboratory where I was working, they were doing just the programming. So this was the main, the main um, um, uh, goal of this laboratory to cre cre create uh, um, <coughs> optimization algorithm, algorithm on Fortran to test them and all things like that, so starting from this Perfa card, so with this old style. And for me, of course, at this moment was very interesting to understand the complexity of algorithm or accelerate them, because at this time, so when you run the method, so you need to sit and wait for the answer, and it took hours, actually. During hours, you don't, cannot do anything because you don't know the result of computation and so on, so I had the impression that this computer is just eating my time of my life, and I was really very interested in making them faster and so on. So this, for me, was the additional motivation for accelerating the methods in the beginning. One way to push on that question a little bit more is that when many of us learned about optimization, we were told about Newton's method and quasi-Newton and all of these high order methods, uh, conjugate gradients maybe, but really LFBG and, and was the dominant methodology. And you two came along and you said, no, gradients are the right way to go, only gradients. And I'm gonna be able to do a bit much bigger large scale problems with gradients alone. And I'm not sure you're aware how much you've inspired a generation of researchers who've only learned about gradient descent and stochastic gradient and all of that. And that is the engine that has powered all of the latest developments in AI. It's all gradient trained methods. So I, maybe there was a pushback from the optimization community of what, why in the world are you just focused on gradient descent? Maybe they didn't realize that they were being seen as crazy. I knew I was being seen as crazy. <laughs> that it? Do you think that, w did you get pushback from the optimization community? <laughs> no, uh, optimization actually is really uh, very uh, interesting field because you know I'm working uh, in optimization, and the more we work, in, uh, I'm working during 40 years, uh, so the more the more they work on optimization, more things uh, remain to be done. So it is indeed the, the amount of future work is increasing. And up to now, I didn't know any optimization algorithms which was developed at some time and after that thrown away. All methods they kept uh, alive 
for different applications. Now, for example, suddenly, I don't know, I never imagined that this could happen. So we <coughs> started to, pro to uh, use again this coordinate descent methods, so which is just, I don't know, uh, out of any mod was during several decades, and now it appears for uh, huge scale problems, this is exactly what what we should, should use, random search, and many things. So it appears that indeed we have many, many, many uh, methods, and all of them have some merits. So if you apply them properly, so it depends on the problem class. And since now we have more and more different problem classes, so we really need very big uh, diversity of all methods. So gradient uh, descent also is still alive, and, and so on. So I don't know. It depends on applications. So what are you interested in? Yeah. Add something? I personally didn't start with gradient method. I started with the ellipsoid algorithm. Uh, and then, uh, no, okay. All the time it was, uh, what can you do how to, to, to develop limits of performance? algorithms and to try to find the optimal algorithms. No, so, so the, the, the very first was for non-smooth converse optimization. This was center of gravity. This is not actually implementable algorithm, and so it's an implementable version of it. No, and then you start, I did, did nearly all my initial research on non-smooth optimization, so the different forms of gradient method uh, rise there naturally, mirror descent. Uh, then, uh, when, uh, when you speak about smooth converse minimization, there was a gap between lower complexity bound, which was like one over k square. And what we knew about traditional algorithms like gradient descent, so there was a gap, there was uh, <laughs> Uh, so they converged the rate one over k. k is the number of steps. So there was a gap, it posed a question, and Euro brilliantly answered this question. He designed one over k square converging accelerated gradient algorithms. No, and so what, uh, when I, I knew, of course, what the Newton method is, but you don't have, you did not have complexity results to the best of my knowledge, non-asymptotical complexity results, and those in my book is the only what matters, okay, how many steps you need to solve a problem from a given class, even a given accuracy. So in this respect, Newton method for some time was absolutely of no interest because the results were asymptotical, but then uh, that is uh, self-concordant based theory, change. This is it. You said something about the history there that I'd like just to speak one moment and then I'm going to get to others. Uh, Yuri, when you did the accelerated gradient, I know the paper was 1983. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that Nemirovsky and Yudin was a decade before that. So uh, they had the lower bound of 1 over k squared. Yes. And you didn't know of any algorithm that achieved that. Was that did, did you work on that gap, did you, or did you kind of already know that it was going to be able to be closed, or did you think maybe his lower bound wasn't actually any good? No, actually, there were algorithms. So the, with the rate of convergence, uh, one or k square, but they uh, so developed by Arkady and and Yudin. So they started from the method with uh, two-dimensional search, as far as I remember. And after that, they improved that for one-dimensional search. So therefore, something already existed uh, up to logarithmic factors. Of course, from the practical point of view, the logarithm is not a very uh, good thing, because in some sense, it's a kind of big constant, but a big constant, so which we would like to, um, to avoid. So my, my achievement in this sense was just to propose the algorithm with the same complexity as the gradient method. 
And then, yeah, so this is, but I, I, maybe I should uh, add something uh, to the <coughs> previous topic about the uh, <coughs> different algorithms. You know, so uh, all this development during last, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, so was concentrated on the um, uh, development of the algorithms uh, for the particular problem classes. And in the algorithm, so we use the description of the problem class. But uh, the problem is that actually each function, it belongs to intersection on, of different problem classes. And if you are really, you use the algorithm which is very much oriented to, to a particular problem class, so it will never, uh, can converge faster than it is prescribed for this problem class. And if it appears that your function belongs to another problem class, which you don't know about that, which is better, then you lose. And therefore, so now this is exactly what, what happens today. So the, the beginning of the new stage of development of optimization methods. So when we start to think about the universal methods, methods which adjust automatically to the problem class, best problem classes which contain this particular problem. And here we already come back again, again to the very first optimization schemes, the gradient method. Newton method, because these two guys, they were developed without any knowledge of the problem class, and something they are already universal. And in this sense, they again are quite serious competitor, competitors for all this activity. Okay. All right, are there other comments? Um, perhaps for Professor Figali, your work is in many areas, but including optimal transport, and we were, we're reminded this morning that uh, all these programming, linear programming, started with Kantorovich uh, in, in, you know, in Russia, uh, who was solving, I believe, a kind of allocation problem of moving masses uh, around, and it led to this whole field. But it also led, in mathematics, to deeper developments involving optimal transport and PDs and so on. I don't know if that's kind of one of the connection you could speak to, or there's other things you may want to talk about. Yeah, so, so thank you very much. Sorry for my voice. So, um, yeah, so optimal transport, uh, you know, it was started in France, then was developed in Russia by Kantorovich, and was the beginning of linear programming, which is so important in uh, mathematics. And um, it's really an optimization problem where, uh, you know, they've been given a lot of contributions. And, okay, in my case, I used it mostly for uh, application to PDEs. Uh, but it really shed, shed light in many other areas. Now, my curiosity as a <clears throat> person working on transport, and uh, you know, on transport, we also like to do gradient flows and optimization and minimization problems. And my impression with these um, many of these optimization methods, like uh, accelerated gradient and so on, is that they often rely on the fact that you are in an Hilbertian structure. So you, they often use that, you know, the norm square as magical cancellation when you develop a square. And uh, I wonder whether, um, so this is my question for the two laureates, is um, um, whether uh, you ever thought about um, these kind of methods in a non-flat, non-linear setting, where you, know, you could have a curved geometry and still you would like to do some accelerated descent where you don't have just magical identities that are sometimes very specific to Hilbertian structures. Much about the optimal. Okay, I do not know much about optimal transport uh, from the computational viewpoint. The simplest situation is the discrete one, no, this is just certain specific optimization, commerce optimization problem. But this is it. That, 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 I don't know m more than this. Well, uh, I also do, don't uh, work personally in uh, optical transport, and the reason is that there are, uh, in my opinion, too many people which are working in this field, and it is much better to keep yourself a little bit at some distance from the field which is very crowded. What I know, people indeed, they de develop different uh, first order methods for solving this problem, and now so they 
uh, a very proud about the results, and it, there was a series of results with improving complexity bounds. But I think this is not the end of the story, because so uh, strangely enough, uh, so with all this uh, problem with transportation structure, so after the results of Lee and Sitford, so the interior point method, they come back. Okay, and using the special structure of the Hessian, so they are able indeed to get very good complexity for the interior point methods for solving some transportation problem. And if this will be true for uh, problems with this uh, optimal transport, this will be just great because again, so all gradient methods, so usually they have sublinear cost and interior point, so it is already linear cost. So this will be really the very big um, step in advance, and I hope this will happen at some moment. And this is related indeed to uh, this uh, notion of self-concordant barriers, so which means that we address linear programming problems using some non-linearity, so some non-linear objects which uh, uh, approximate that, so all of this notion of central path and so on, they again, so they may be very, uh, very interesting there. Just to address the question you asked at the end, I'm almost certain there is a Nesterov acceleration on Riemannian manifolds. We could, I can look it up on my cell phone here while we talk, but I'm pretty sure that, that it's not restricted to Euclidean geometry. I mean, there are some tricks that it can exploit there, but I don't think, I'm pretty sure. Manifolds need to be smooth. So if I have like a manifold of probability measures with masses and distance, then I'm so I, I, don't I don't know how much smoothness then you need. That, I don't know how far it extends in that, in that sense. Yeah. I mean, there aren't many characterizations of acceleration, uh, of if and only if sort of statements that I'm aware of. Um, other questions or comments or perspectives? Maybe Shule, you're a machine learning person. Uh, there was some provocative comments about optimization and, uh, and machine learning. I wondered if you wanted to contribute to that line of discussion. Okay, uh, maybe I talk a little bit expanded. Uh, I think the mathematics and AI basically can classify three, three class of this uh, integrations. All day or classical way is uh, by the machine learning. Just Michael Jordan said, it's uh, statistics is a ma major part and the optimization optimization is probability, this kind of thing is a traditional learning. But a traditional AI is for discrete math, usually like the graphics and like the search, like the reasoning. Uh, the second class is a recent few years, it's called AI for science. In this case, some kind of uh, uh, especially mathematicians at the physics field, they try to use data, try to change some of the equation or model, in, integrate into some kind of uh, traditional functions, try to study. This also, many mathematicians are interested in this. Also, on the other hand, is uh, some kind of uh, equation or those constraints from the classical theory can be built a constraint then on the machine learning model as constraint. This is second class. The third one maybe go recent years much deeper. Uh, I mentioned three branch. One is uh, actually very old already. It's uh, from Simon, uh, Carnegie Mellon Simon, Professor Simon started that way for cautious ordering this study. And uh, this uh, Chinese uh, AI professor Wu Wenjun on the machine theory proving. This is uh, all on the algebra, on the polynomial equation, how to deco decoupling them to by the triangulize. This kind of way, recently, I also work on some of uh, this uh, extension on this. This is one on the algebra equations. 
The other one is uh, recently getting very hot is uh, so-called generative the AI. Most is uh, interesting earlier is just the auto encoder. Then later go to some even in the uh, early 90s. Also, I also have some model on that kind of and recently go to so-called uh, diffusion model. Diffusion model then make the AI go to really deep mathematics. On one hand, it's go to statistical differential equations. The, then continually, it go to differential geometries. Some kind of recent, like uh, remaining geometry, those kind of things also go in. This makes the learning really get deep coupled with the mathematician and the AI and the physics. Last one I mentioned is uh, recently you by the chart GPT have uh, revealed one of the importance is the so-called emergence. Emergence is a very large number of parameters. Then you need a very long time, scale up training time. Then you also need uh, some global constraint structures. All these three together, then how to affect the global behavior is a mini learning performance or so-called emergence, all those things. I think this is three new branch, really interesting, uh, may encourage you, really some of the mathematician comes, especially the last one is meaning complex system is already studied for a long time, but now seems a complex system needs to go to really deep, like uh, I mentioned, the scale, time, and the structure, how affect the global behavior. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, maybe to try to uh, turn that a bit into a question, um, anyone who has played with ChatGPT, uh, I think is impressed, and, and those of us who worked on underlying methods for a long, long time, are somewhat surprised. Um, just gradient descent, somehow with the right architecture and a huge, vast amount of data, can do some things that maybe we wouldn't have thought it could do. And so an example is sort of limited forms of reasoning. It, it can really think through, in some sense, think through uh, a, a sequence of, of uh, assertions and, and there's some logic and all that behind it. So maybe a question would be whether either of you have actually played with ChatGPT or, or watch someone else play with it? And um, if you have any reaction, to, are you surprised or are you impressed uh, that gradient descent um, in this new class of problems is uh, as effective and surprisingly good as it is? Well, I personally did it, um, play with ChatGPT, but uh, I have a friend who asked him, uh, so, who is Yuri Nesterov? And I have seen the answer, actually. So, I am sorry, but, well, a, a half of uh, this information was completely wrong. So, something which I never did, and, uh, for example, it appears I am a member of National uh, Academy of Science in France. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe that's a prediction for the future. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is a prediction. And uh, that I had a laboratory in, in Moscow, which, which was never true, and, and all things like that. For me, so this technique is indeed now it is a kind of uh, toys or games for people. So they're just trying different uh, variants of such system, which are of course I interesting, but uh, at this moment I don't think that this is some, some, something serious. And I would also uh, add uh, maybe some comment about artificial intelligence. For me, artificial intelligence, it is not only machine learning, actually. So it is much wider. It is indeed something which can help people to do some uh, intellectual works, for example, uh, what things what uh, Arkady today presented, the construction of bridges, you could ask, uh, I don't know, artificial intelligence to construct a bridge, why not? And he, he should, I don't know, propose a solution. So I think so we should, 
Uh, it is better to think about this um, new uh, direction, so in a wider sense, not only the image recognition or machine learning or, or whatever. It, it is a much wider concept. You might be surprised by its design capabilities. And, and I'm, I'm with someone who's been very skeptical. But if you ask it to design a bridge with a certain number of trusses and all, uh, it, it, would, it would not surprise me if it did pretty well. Now, in maybe 10 years, it would actually call a convex optimization procedure, and it would do what, Ar what Arcadi did on the board earlier. But it, it's, it's beyond uh, simply just pattern recognition and, and you know, finding things in images and uh, what we were seeing five years ago. Uh, it, it really is able to do some kind of a design thing. It could do computer programming up to a certain level uh, in ways that my computer programming colleagues think has changed their field completely. Uh, now, is it mathematics? No. Is, is, is this any of this rigorous? No. But it is surprising. Yes, Arkady, please. I did play with uh, chat uh, GPT. The first question I asked was uh, literally X and Y are two real numbers, what is greater X and Y. I got an answer X, don't ask me why, uh, so that, that there were no numbers. But there was very significant progress uh, over the, like one year because now uh, the same question is uh, answered that uh, it depends what, uh, what are X and Y. Now, now, again, at the very first uh, play, I asked who I am, and it turned out that I uh, wrote uh, War and Peace, which I did not. Uh, okay, so, but I would say that in my opinion that this artificial intelligence, as it is presented here, it's mainly engineering uh, achievement, great engineering achievement. They solve the problems which on my lifespan we were all the time considered like speech recognition, image recognition, which were considered absolutely intractable. But uh, I don't think that the, the progress came from optimization. That's my personal opinion. It is an engineering achievement, and the engineers may do many, many things which mathematicians cannot. For example, chess. Uh, computer uh, chess. Uh, when, when mathematicians, which I personally know, they were excellent mathematicians. Did it in the 60s and 70s that those chess programs were uh, beaten by uh, mediocre chess player. But uh, after the engineers start to do it, no, you know that uh, in somewhere in 1990s, Kasparov lost to computer. So this is, in my opinion, what we have here today is mainly engineering achievement. Great indeed, great engineering achievement, but I do not think that you can, can build all this from the first principle, from, from optimization or something like that. Have we gotten close enough to your interests to trigger a question? That's it. Okay, well, I'm the most pure mathematician here, so I'm the furthest away from your research. I was actually interested in knowing if there was any specific uh, real-world application that had inspired you to, pre to pursue your research, and as a follow-up, has there been any application that you were not expecting, but nevertheless, you enjoyed? Okay, I was a mathematician by training, I did not care about applications, so it was uh, indeed like uh, I wanted to prove theorems. But those uh, theorems were not about relations between notions, not descriptive. Th they were indeed theorems with, with, with proofs, not, not, not sometimes uh, non-trivial, but this was about justification of computational tools, uh, of computations. So those. Uh, this is the uh, operational side of math. At the end of the day, you want to get a number, but you are interested how long the, the day will last. So that this was, uh, in my life, I only once, 20 years ago, was close to a real application. This was computerized tomography. 
ну, томографии, позитро намешан томографии, вы отдаете две трать, то carry out maximum lighter hood computation for very well structured convex problem, but of, at that time disastrous dimension, like uh, millions of decision variables. So we, ну, окей, да, да, алгоритм ведь finally was implemented, was not exactly what I was doing, but our алгоритм also somehow worked, it was mere of death. But this was the only, unfortunately, because I would be happy to do something which has real value and not just, uh, how to say, the, the paper spoiled. Uh, but this is the only uh, in 50 years of my research, the only situation I was close to something real. Uh, actually, for me, uh, for me I, indeed, so then there was uh, there is an application which was very motivating for me, uh, uh, both from the viewpoint of modeling and also development of the algorithms. And this is the modeling of uh, congestion in transportation networks. Okay, so everybody knows what is the problem. We have a city, so there, is, there are many drivers which are going to travel inside the city by the road, so they are free in the, their route choice. And suddenly, so very efficient roads have become congested and you are staying in all these uh, um, queues during, I don't know, hour or something like that. And you have a lot of time to think what happens and why all of that is so inefficient, how you can model all of that and, and so on. And finally, so when uh, I worked on that, so I... Um, really came to the model of uh, equilibrium model, so which can uh, compute, um, uh, predict these conditions. So it is called, uh, well, finally I even published this, this is uh, called uh, stable dynamics. And this was really very uh, important for me from the viewpoint of understanding of the uh, subgradient method for uh, minimizing uh, non-differential function because there actually you have a very beautiful picture, primal dual picture of the situation. So for example, if primal variables are delays uh, uh, at the intersections, then the dual variables become the flows of, of cars, which are also very interesting to to compute, and actually this means that if, if we apply to these problems the subgradient methods, we need to do uh, primal dual methods. So it was the first primal dual methods which we managed to develop for minimization of non-smooth function, which at the same time so compute both approximation to the primal variables and to the dual variables. And uh, there is a really very beautiful mathematics there. You have, for example, the travel time function between uh, this uh, origin and destination, which is piecewise linear function with exponential uh, number of pieces, but <clears throat> which value you can compute in polynomial time using the shortest path algorithm and so on. Really very, very beautiful mathematics around it. For me, it was a really very uh, motivating uh, uh, model which I keep uh, in mind up to now. Both of you, must, much of your work has been done in discrete uh, time, discrete algorithms. Um, that allows you to get the convergence, uh, you know, finite time convergence results that you want. Um, I know that Poliak also did some work in continuous time, and, and uh, uh, Alessio was alluding earlier to gradient flow. So in mathematics, often it's useful to go to the continuous time formalism. Um, and I wondered if you feel like that's just an alternative to what you've done, or is it kind of fundamentally not the useful way to think about optimization to be in continuous time? How does it interact with your characterization earlier of you know the need to have time results uh, in, in mathematics? Okay. I do not think that, that there is something which is a priori useless. 
It depends on the results. I personally indeed did start development of mirror descent from continuous time model. And then it was discretized. Okay, it was uh, continuous time model was absolutely transparent uh, and discretization was easy. So at the end of the day, if you are speaking about uh, algorithms, you need discrete time procedure, but where it comes from, from whatever. The, 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 there are no good and bad sources. Proof of pudding is in it. Yeah. Uh, I also have a mixed feeling about continuous time and discrete time. So there are situations when continuous time uh, um, considerations are really very useful. For example, all theory of interior point methods so is based on uh, the analysis of central path, which is continuous time trajectory. On the other hand, uh, uh, for continuous time uh, approach, uh, yes, there are some uh, obstacles. So I mean that if you have a boundary of the set, okay, you need to do something to avoid this boundary. So to go inside and to keep the trajectory smooth because when you, a boundary and convex set is actually a very dangerous object. It is very bad uh, with uh, combinatorial structure and all things like that. So the, therefore the uh, digital strategy sh should keep somehow inside the feasible set if this is possible then this is fine if if not uh, then uh, yeah so then uh, I, I guess we have trouble but of course uh, continuous time uh, uh, well uh, um, it was the the beginning of the field as far as I remember people which started to do optimization in the beginning of 60s, so they started from continuous time. This, uh, yes, and this was very useful for them. So the uh, problem is that we need some uh, uh, machinery which transform the results in continuous time into the results for discrete time, because anyway we discretize when we, uh, yeah. So I don't know. I, I would say that both approaches are useful and, uh, yeah, in any case, we should keep in mind uh, both of them. Uh, in algorithm design, we come up against this problem of time limit. You, know, you have to optimize for time. It's not just the time. It's also memory. It's also bandwidth. It's, and it turns out many times you can trade one for the other. For example, if you're computationally limited for time, you can essentially make, if you have infinite amount of memory, you can trade that. They're kind of completely tradable. The same is true with bandwidth. The, those three parameters are the ones we are all the time are trying to optimize. You know, speed, memory, and bandwidth. The question is, how can we optimally, uh, is there a mathematical theory or is there a theory which would help uh, people designing algorithms of uh, what, which way to go? You know, depend, if I have a lot of memory, but not enough, my, my computation cycles are not fast enough, I might want to do certain things. If I have a lot of computation, but no memory, they're tradable, it turns out. Uh, how do you balance between all of these, uh, these things? I can come back and comment on chess and speech and other things later, but we'll see. Well, this is a very interesting and difficult question, actually, because all these uh, particular limitations, they indeed make the analysis very complicated, and uh, indeed uh, it becomes, uh, if you want, a combinatorial problem, actually, which uh, maybe is in Pihard or whatever, I don't know. So there are some simple results uh, uh, which are typical for 
complexity theories um, in convex optimizations, which tell, tell us that even if you have infinite memory, do whatever you want at each iteration, any complexity, anything. So the only restriction so is the number of computation of the function value of the gradient. Then, e even if you have all of that, you cannot converge faster. Yes, then something. There are some low complexity bounds. And strangely enough, so all these lower complexity bounds are achieved on very simple algorithms, which do not need a lot of memory, just, I don't know, like in fast gradient method, you just double the, uh, instead of one array uh, for uh, containing the point, you have two and something like that. So, which means that there are indeed situations where, um, okay, so the complexity comes from the structure of the function, not even from the limitation, uh, physical li limitation. But with physical limitations, so I don't know. This is an open question. And again, so it is not, it is open not only as far as I know for optimization. There are some simpler things like linear algebra, where people have more or less uh, very often a similar, a similar situation, limitations on memory and so on. And they, they also, they cannot, uh, they, they do not know anything about that. It is a difficult question. I think it's a very good question. I mainly agree with Yuri. But uh, there is a setting uh, which, to the best of my knowledge, does not resolve this complexity setting. That when indeed the number of functional computations is uh, that there are lower bounds which are independent of memory of whatever. But you can say, okay, the points where I am computing the function, normally you, you have computed that sequence of search points, and uh, given the results of uh, say the values and derivatives, you de define uh, uh, the next point at which you will learn your function. But you can say, okay, given the same, I'll uh, look at, uh, define 100 of points. When in this 100 of points, I'll compute my function uh, simultaneously. And this could affect, so the number of functional computations uh, would become perhaps larger, but the number of time slots in which you carry out this computation could be smaller. So the results on this time of parallelization of functional computations, uh, complexity lower bounds, which I know, I wouldn't say that they are no, but the, the, they are, I would say, negative. So in my opinion, optimization in this black box form, so you have a function, you want to minimize it, and how you can learn it, compute values and derivatives at the point. Okay? So in my opinion, this is intrinsically sequential process. Uh, parallelization and simultaneous computation at many points, unless the, the, the many is exponentially many. Okay, of course you can compute it simultaneously values of your function at a dense grid and you will get uh, optimum in one step. No, this is one thing I believe this black box optimization is uh, uh, the, the, and the, 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 the algorithms for white the families of uh, functions, they are of this black box nature. On the other hand, I would say that this very approach is somehow misleading because there are interesting families of problems like linear programming, but this is only the beginning. Okay, where you just, uh, you, you know the structure. For example, you are speaking about linear or semi-definite programming. Uh, yeah, you know the structure, you are not supposed to, and indeed good methods do not compute the values and the gradients of the objective, they do something different. They work directly on the data and convert those data to the... Uh, so here, I don't know, here perhaps parallelization of linear algebra which is involved in those algorithms like interior points, and it could help. 
So finally, in real life, we're solving semi-definite problem. You need to solve, to assemble and solve few tens, indeed few tens, in normal situations, of linear systems. And uh, the, if you can uh, parallelize, uh, you will be. But this, this is again, this is not uh, acceleration of optimization, it's acceleration of steps which we should carry out solving linear systems. So uh, there are two related questions. Uh, one is, uh, there was a mention about Herb Simon's work on, um, for which he got Nobel Prize. That was, he basically said human beings, when faced with difficult problems, do not optimize. They are incapable of taking into account thousands or millions of different parameters. Just, and, they, and so what he said was, they usually come up with good enough solutions. And so I, I was always kind of disappointed with that statement, namely, don't optimize, satisfies, is, is the slogan, you know, sound right. Uh, but there must be some way of parameterizing or limiting what is the best that can be done with, if you have human type limitations of your, your the human brain has infinite memory, but operates at five millisecond cycle time. And therefore it has certain fundamental limitations of what kinds of things it can do. So I was, I always felt there must be some better way of formalizing uh, uh, Simon's statement. So, and this Simon's statement goes back to 1940s or 50s. For, um, and, um, but uh, so the, that, that's one broad set of issues of when do you optimize, when do you not optimize? See, you know, just satisfies is good enough if you have a satisfiable solution. The other related thing is we are almost always resource limited. It's, you know, algorithms when you're designing them, we have time limit, memory limit, or bandwidth limit, and all of them come into play sooner or later. And uh, as I mentioned, you can trade them sometimes, but the, there are problems, so the issue is, are there theoretical formalization that might lead to some good solutions? And related thing is the chat GPT business. Right now, in order to compute those models in GPT-4, they, they're essentially using infinite amount of computation, infinite amount of time, and one of the frustrating things for people in universities is we don't have such resources. And the question is, supposing I gave you one hundredth of the computation and one hundredth of the memory and one hundredth, what is the best you can do? Are you, can you get close enough to GPT-4? And what, how would you go about doing it? How would you, if there are some formalizations or some theories, that would kind of you know, shine, shine light on that, that would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, there is a very nice book by Chepik in which the, there is a very simple and um, important observation. Then while people tried to fly by mimicking birds, they failed. So to, to fly the, 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 the aircraft is something completely different. And this, I believe, is true. We should not compare what we can do, uh, do in, uh, I don't know, silicon, with what we can do in our brain. Uh, no, again, as uh, uh, everybody knows, the, the possibility to decide, looking at the picture, whether it is man or woman, so all my long life was considered absolutely intractable problem. On the other hand, every kid 
No help of school, but it doesn't require, he doesn't require uh, huge computers, he do, does it somehow, and uh, this is expensive no how, how expensive is to, how to say that, to create a human being. Uh, no, not too expensive. So this is what uh, about comparison of um, human decision making and computerized decision making. Also, you just, in my opinion, for whatever it is what you want, you just cannot ask for computer to be similar to a human. Or that then, okay, if the, the only difference is that human is, uh, that, that uh, how to uh, sub, subtract, that the uh, computer is made from silicon, well, perhaps you can get a human being from silicon, something with the same mobility, but uh, this will be not optimization, this will be not math, this will be something different. It will be an engineering or biological achievement. No, and this question, how to trade, then, no, that, in my opinion, that this is an important question, a good question, but, but in my opinion, no, okay, you should look at the situation and think. And uh, unless there is artificial intelligence which you know how to do it, which I don't, am not aware of, this is the only way. You cannot predict the outcome, but you should think. Depends on the situation and uh, on your abilities. This is my opinion, not very optimistic, but what I have, I have. Maybe I uh, can add something about the um, optimization uh, with respect to the human behavior. So I think so. He, we should um, distinguish two, two uh, uh, situations. So when the uh, person, so he, he makes uh, the so, so, uh, <clears throat> some decision about something, and then of course he can be not rational. You can take into consideration, I don't know, some maybe new information he read in the paper, or maybe he is doing mistakes, or, or maybe something else. But always when we uh, consider the subconscious behavior, then it is rational. There's no reason to, to do something in a bad way. So subconsciously, so very often people are rational, no, not only people, the animals are rational. For animals, there is no reason to deviate from the um, rational behavior. And in my lecture, I actually uh, had a couple of means to discuss this algorithm of rational behavior. And there, there is some interesting situation because there is this uh, uh, objective function, cost function for the person, for the agent, but actually by his behavioral pattern, he minimizes something else. It is not his objective function, not this cost function. So, but it is something which is quite close to it, but not, not exactly that. And this minimization process, he simply he doesn't understand that he minimizes something. Just reacts, just immediate reaction on, on some random distribution or something like that. But it can be considered as optimization, I wouldn't say that this is a rational uh, behavior, but doesn't matter because for us uh, at this moment it is important the predictability. The fact that the person by his behavior without understanding that minimizes some objective function means that he is predictable. We know where he ends up. And this is uh, important for the analysis of such situations. Just to add a couple of comments, we're close to my topics now. So, um, when I was a graduate student, we were uh, my group was David Rummelhart and Jeffrey Hinton and others who were interested in brain style computation. Uh, let's go far away from Turing model and far away from von Neumann architecture. And so, we were only allowed to have operations that the brain could plausibly do. So, we were allowed in learning systems to use the Hebb rule, which required no signals to be propagated around, it's just local methods. And, uh, you know, five years of progress happened slowly where, you know, rediscovering linear algebra routines of various kinds. 
at some point, David Rommelhart decided he would uh, break the rules, that he would uh, design an algorithm that would uh, go backwards through the neural network, and it would calculate, eventually, partial derivatives. And he re-derived the backpropagation algorithm. And at some point, someone raised their hand and said, isn't this just gradient descent? And he said, yeah, it's just gradient descent. Anyway, that's the breakthrough. That was 1986, and all of the deep learning stuff is all based on backpropagation. And the amazing thing is that gradient descent in three billion dimensions actually still works in a non-convex problem. And that's what I think Yuri finds very surprising or amusing, and, and not, it's not rigorous, but it's true. Um, and and I, I think that it's critical to understand that that was the development in what we now call AI. It was not understanding the human. Simon had a different idea. Simon wanted to understand the human, and that would lead to artificial intelligence and great things. That's not what happened. It was moving away from understanding the human and allowing an algorithm to be developed that's very simple, but the brain may not do, at least in the way we thought it might be doing. And once you move to that, wonderful things happen. And then we rediscovered the mathematics of gradient descent and started to understand how deeply uh, surprising a gradient is in three billion dimensions and what it can do. Uh, so I think it really is critical. I think of these folks as engineers trying to develop systems that will work in the real world, provably guaranteed, and will, you know, if you're gonna build a transportation system or a medical system, I would rely on them, and I would not rely on satisficing. In fact, uh, Arcadi can show you that if you satisfy some certain robust control problems, you will totally ruin everything. It'll be terrible. Um, so I think it's very important. This, to me, is an AI that one, it's an engineering-oriented AI, and it's not the science AI of, of Simon and, and, and Newell and others, which was understand humans first, and then we'll know what to do. But, <clears throat> but there's a real engineering problem we are facing, namely, can we achieve the same level of GPT-4-like AI with one millionth of the computation capability, memory cap and comp and how would we go about determining that? And people have proposed various ablation of experiments where you remove different connections to see how much worse the system is. And the problem is that's a combinatorially exponential uh, deciding problem. To, to, you can't remove one, one connection at a time and see uh, in three billion connections or something to do that. The question is, there is an optimization problem there somewhere. I don't know what it is. I, can't, I don't even know how to specify it. But if, if, if some, some effort, you know, of ma mathematical effort, if you want to call it that, can be ex uh, can be a, you know, used to identify directions in which we need to go to do the same, bring the, give the same result with a million times less computation. And that would be a, a, a useful way of looking at it. And uh, I don't know whether, how to formulate No, quantum computing, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, I, I do want to return to another issue, though, that I think I, before, and then we'll open it up for uh, more broadly. Uncertainty and not optimizing the thing you think you're optimizing to me are really important. So, uh, in fact, one of the things that humans do badly um, is that we often will not choose the single most optimal option. We'll choose some kind of a blend. And so an example is that, you know, a two-armed bandit, like I suppose there's a, a lake here, and I want to get food, and, and there's uh, you know 70 uh, grains of food per minute over here, and there's 30 over here. And as I start to learn about that situation, what I will do eventually, I'll converge in, in equilibrium to spending 70% 70, 70 of my time here and 30% time here. That's called probability matching. And humans do this all the time in all kinds of situations. Now, the optimal thing to do is, of course, to be the Bayesian. Once you figure out the probability is higher over here, you should go there all the time, right? But people don't just kind of, you know, they're not just a little bit away from that. They do this other thing called probability matching, which is quite far from that. Okay, so that seems irrational. It seems stupid. It's not optimizing the quantity you care about, which is your rate. 
But now if you broaden the problem and you say, I'm not just an optimizing problem, I'm going to cast my algorithm inside of a collection of other algorithms. I'm going to be in a society, all right? And I'm going to worry about equilibrium in my society and not optimization of a single individual. And so now you imagine a bunch of people that are all coming to this lake. If every one of them was Bayesian and went over there, they'd get some food, but there would be an opportunity being missed over here, right? And actually, if you now work out the overall equal, the Nash equilibrium for this problem, you'll find it is to send 70% of the people here and 30% here. So each individual should probability match if they're going to be in a collection of like-minded individuals, right? Uh, turning this more close to mathematics, if you take a zero-sum game and you do what's called fictitious play in economics, you optimize based on all the history you've seen from the other player, the optimal next choice, and both of you do that, that will provably diverge. Right? So, um, in some sense, it, it feels that optimization perspective on these kind of more so social or game theoretic problems is limited. Uh, on the other hand, more positively, one of your, I think, colleagues, uh, Korpelovich, developed the extra gradient algorithm, which takes gradients and doesn't go down the gradient and will actually converge in the case of the zero-sum game. So, I don't know if this is some, food, some yeah, I'm sure you have opinions about these sort of issues, but uh, to me, broadly speaking, in a, if we're going to talk about AI, we have to talk about it in the context of multiple, you know, a society and where there's the constraints arise because there are other individuals that want things, we want them, we can't singly optimize, we have to find some kind of a Pareto or, you know, satisfying solution in the terms of the society. What actually is the question? Well, I mean, I guess the question is more broad. It's not really for the two of you. So it's, it's if we're, we're talking about foundations of this new field emerging called AI, which is based on data, it's based on algorithms that run in certain amounts of time, and it's based on somehow making humans happier, right? It can't be that we simply take out a human and replace it with an optimizing algorithm or a computer that optimized. That can't be the model for AI. And, and so I'm arguing that, at, at minimally, at a bit of an economics perspective that has some game theory in it, where you don't actually optimize individually, you design algorithms that will actually find equilibria, is perhaps a better foundation for AI, or it's an augmented, it's not that it's not an alternative, it's an augmented foundation, which builds on the perspective that you've developed, but it's not the same. It, it goes towards fixed points rather than towards optima. And, um, so this is perhaps broader, than, and you're, you're more than welcome to comment, but if others want to weigh in here, um, <coughs> please. It took me back to my PhD thesis of 55 years ago, which was on, it started with two-armed bandits, uh, and I was wondering, when you came up with the, you said there's 70 grains of here and 30 grains here, do we know that, do you ever figure that out exactly? Because what, it, it, in the two-arm bandit problem, if you have unlimited memory, then you should try the seemingly inferior one infinitely often, but at a density of sampling that tends to zero. And so I was just, I, I didn't, I don't know enough about this, but in AI, do you actually know, or in the example you had, do you really know for sure that it's 70-30, or do you need to sample the inferior well, one? You're absolutely right. There's a beautiful, there's now textbooks on our multi-arm bandits that give finite time conversions rates for the sampling process you have to go through, um, and there's a range of upper and lower bounds known, um, and it all feeds into this overall equilibrium that you will converge to a Nash if you have a so-called no-regret algorithm running, which is doing the kind of thing you're doing. My PhD so, thesis, just to tell you, was on, I went from two arm bandits to, to basically hypothesis <laughs> testing yes. with finite memory. That's and, right. And it turned out the probability of error goes to zero exponentially in the number of states of memory, so doubly exponentially in the number of bits of memory, so it wasn't that important, but it was a nice result. Uh, one other question. We've been talking, uh, Raj brought up uh, time memory trade-offs, and when you have a memory that becomes larger and larger and larger, you really should be expanding the number of processors as well, because uh, if, the, if the memory becomes essentially infinite, then the cost of the, cost of the computer is dominated by the memory, 
and in that case, you should have multiple processors. And I, in fact, found this in a cryptographic, I came up with a cryptographic time memory trade-off, which was really a cryptographic time memory processor trade-off, which I didn't realize till later. So I've got two papers, one on the time memory trade-off and the other on time memory processor trade-offs. And I'm just wondering, especially when you talk about the human brain, there's a lot of parallel processing that's going on. So have people looked at the idea of uh, time memory processor trade-offs? Well, I, I can give you uh, <clears throat> one hypothesis or it goes back to Kahneman 1, Kahneman 2 types of results. If you, all the Kahneman 1 are instantaneous recognition. They're all using infinite memory. They store episodic components and don't, and if they can recognize it instantaneously in you know, less than 100 milliseconds, you get the result. Kahneman 2 requires reasoning and derivation, abstraction, symbols, and all kinds of things, chunking. And that is where we don't have stored memory solutions. So in the long run, even in chess, when we were building the early chess machines, even the one that was the deep blue machine, there was a large table lookup at the beginning for all the possible moves, all the different things up to a certain point. And uh, that was limited by the size of the memory they had at, at that point, at each, each time, going back to Greenblatt's program and so on. So I think we have always had this trade-off between using memory to minimize computation and, and uh, where you don't have memory you have the, the, the limitations. So I think um, the optimization problem is given a particular size memory, a particular speed computation, what is the right approach to a, a given algorithmic solution? Is all, this, is all this for a single processor or do you deal with multiple pro mul Is all this for a single processor with the very large memory or do you deal with multiple processors? Multiple processing, literally, uh, if you look at more recent psychology results, they, they predict that there's a small computer in your brain that all that it does is recognize your mother's face, nothing else. It's specialized for that. And there are millions of those specialized, specialized age, you know, entities in the brain, and they're specialized for a particular function. At this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience. If there is anyone out there that has a, uh, a question uh, for our laureates, um, can you bring a microphone to the front row here so we can have a question? And at the bottom, if you may have to slide it on, although Hello. Yeah. Um, my name is Dimitri. I'm re representing the Royal Institution of Naval Architects based in, in London. So um, I have a question to you. Optimization, we can say like a synonym of improvement, um, making our life better in some ways. So could you please give like a few examples where the optimization actually improved our lives? So obviously there are thousands of examples, but to you, so what's your best um, examples of the improvement. Can I do one quickly and let them, while they pause? Uh, supply chain. The world's largest stochastic control systems ever built, ever conceived of are supply chains behind things like Alibaba and Amazon. Billions of products and hundreds of millions of people. Uh, it's all done with optimization. Absolutely. It was no human could ever have done that. And people don't talk about it much, but it's all optimization. And that, I mean, it's arguably changed our lives as much as anything I could think of. 
said uh, I was exactly once in my life close to actual application uh, that this was positron emission tomography. No, and uh, okay, it, it worked. It even was implemented uh, for, for some time at least. I don't know how, what they are doing today. Uh, but 20 years ago, it was implemented by actual uh, company which produced uh, positron emission tomographs. <coughs> no, now, again, that this is uh, not about optimization, this is about me. As it happened, I did not uh, work with uh, actual applications. No, I believe that they are some of them, but if you ask me whether I could put my finger on something and say, look, that this is about real life, and I contributed to it, I cannot. But this is about me, not about optimization. <coughs> well, <coughs> uh, for me, actually, well, I don't... Uh, uh, I cannot say that this makes uh, the life better or, or not, but at least so the optimization helps to understand uh, this uh, traffic congestion, for example, in order to understand where you will have the conjected places. Uh, the, for that, you need to solve large-scale optimization problem, and you will see exactly how people go and what are the bad places and so on. For me, it is a positive example because, in principle, this information can be used by authorities to change something. I don't know if they are doing this or not, but at least they, they, they get this possibility. <laughs> no, yeah. Now this is another story, of course. It's a little bit different. Yeah. Definitely go on and give other examples, so just to say. I think it's, we're not as aware. We're aware of cell phones and you know communication and the successes of technology there. But very often behind the scenes, at the back end of companies, uh, it's all optimization because it's just too complicated. Uh, you know, and, the, and in the 40s and 50s, the fields of operations research you know, grew and became a real thing. They supported all the technology of that era. Building a chemical factory that makes medicine or makes polymers, it's all optimization and optimal control and control theory. But we don't talk about it very much, it's just maybe not sexy, but it's still sitting there behind, you know, designing the air traffic control system, optimization. Why do we not have planes crashing all the time? Optimization. Allocation problems of all kinds, optimization. Um, and so I, I think it's very important to highlight, uh, you know, that there's mathematical foundations to it and they're beautiful and important and rigorous. Uh, but the reach of it in human society, especially as we grow and, be, you know, get to 10 billion people and whatever, all the allocation problems and, uh, and all the complexities of measuring the right thing at the right time uh, is all going to depend yet more on all of this, tech, this kind of style of thinking and design. It also, it blends mathematics and modeling with design, as we've talked qu about quite a bit. Design means you're going to do something that actually works in the real world, and optimization is the core of all of that. So I don't know if you're trying to trigger a... Uh, uh, defensive optimization, but it's an easy one to give. I saw another hand up. Is there another? Was there another question back there? Yes, please. Yeah, it's a very nice summary of yours, but from a, a different uh, scientific perspective, aren't you? I see the optimization should be something as general as, uh, as evolution. So I'm kind of curious why nobody here talk about the connection of uh, optimization to evolutionary dynamics. It's my question here. What do you mean by evolutionary dynamic, actually? So this is... <clears throat> yeah, let's, uh, if we go back to read Darwin's book, Origin of a Species, I think he 
these three words he emphasizes a lot. One, of course, is evolution. Another word is variation. And the third one will be the selection. So this constituting the evolutionary dynamics. And uh, from a, a scientific perspective, then that's obviously is an appraisation procedure. So I don't know why here nobody sees the connection. Well, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, optimization is present in uh, all uh, evo evolution and evolutionary dynamics because uh, so um, the survival of uh, species so is based on rational behavior. If there is no rational behavior, the chances to survive are very low. Also, so there is some of this. Uh, I believe. The natural selection, which is also uh, uh, based on uh, optimization. So on the lower level, it is everywhere. So it is just the internal, uh, let me say, engine, which helps uh, to development of any system. So it's uh, universal. Yeah, it, it is absolutely so, universal. So and still, that's what we are talking about here. Well, we, we, it is a, a special topic, and uh, actually it, it takes a lot of time and maybe background. So it is not for very short presentation, which we had here. Thank you. Uh, there's zero at order optimization, where you only allow yourself function values, and you don't really allow yourself derivatives. These guys started first order and went above that. And zeroth order is a little closer to Darwinian evolution. I can evaluate my fitness, and then the, the method will then go uphill in fitness. Um, and it works at very, very long, large time scales if you have billions of years to wait. But I think that these are impatient people, so they want to get to the optima a little faster. When I took a course on adaptive systems over 55 years ago, I thought there was something on evolution where the, but then the other thing I remember is in 1987, uh, I worked on a book with the uh, Soviets, uh, Soviet Academy of Sciences, on uh, called Breakthrough Emerging New Thinking. And one of the papers in it was on uh, by Axelrod, who worked on the evolution of cooperation. And it's uh, this is different from optimization theory, but it showed that tit for tat was the best uh, uh, um, uh, strategy in a prisoner's dilemma type situation, in a repeated prisoner's dilemma. So there is, I think, some work in this area. But it's maybe not. Um, I mean, there's a yeah, huge literature on learning in games, and, and and repeated games, and tit for tat is one of many strategies that has got some nice properties, provably and in and in practice, you see people often using tit for tat. But now we're in game theory, which we were sort of, you know, not going to uh, that naturally. But game theory, yeah, your evolution and game theory interact, and there's a huge literature on evolutionary game theory, uh, which is probably the more natural place to put some of that. In just pure optimization land, genetic algorithms were kind of the attempt, and that really failed. Let's just be honest about it, it really failed. These, the, the methods that we see here from these are the ones that succeeded, uh, whereas genetic algorithms failed. But if you move into game theory and cooperation and competition and all that, then all different classes of adaptive algorithms are appropriate. All right, any other questions? I think I see two, several, there's three. Okay, good, we're starting to generate good questions, so please. Hello, my question is, um, is there a way that we can understand conscious, uh, probably define it in mathematical ways or other things that can be understood by us? Is there a thing is called um, artificial conscious? How should we understand these questions? Thank you. You'll get an answer unless they want no, to have okay. you offer. Okay, the, the, there is very simple uh, maxima, never say never. <laughs> well, actually, you may have missed it. There was a mor this morning's talk by Manuel Blum and Lenore Blum on conscious Turing machine. They have, in the last three, four years, they've been trying to formalize thinking in some mathematical way, just like the Turing machine, 
formalize the computation about how, how to define consciousness. It's, it's pretty good. You, you should, uh, there are papers, if you go look in the YouTube, you'll find some things. They're, they've done a good job. Thank you for the excellent discussion. Um, I have uh, interesting topics about, uh, about the computer science application in the brain, uh, and I want to know if there are any breakthrough discoveries or computer science can simulate the signal uh, works in, the, in our brain. Thanks. The, the last sentence, I, I don't think we understood. Slow down a little bit. Okay, because I'm, in, uh, I'm studying the neuroscience uh, uh, research. Uh, yes, and I'm also interested in the psychologist, and so I'm, I'm, we know that uh, the, there are many uh, psychology diseases that cannot be uh, well treated because the lack of evidence or how the brain works. So the disease cannot be uh, cured. So I wondered if there are any uh, breakthrough uh, computer science or mathematics that can simulate how uh, we can understand how our brain works. Okay. Brain works. How brain works? Do you know how the brain works? No. 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 There is another part of this. Uh, there's the life science and medicine. You know, and there's some there's some remarkable people in this building today who worked on the molecular biology of neurons and other cells. And really, I, I think uh, I'm not in that world, but I deeply admire it. And uh, we're not gonna understand thinking in the brain, I think, in our lifetime, but I think we'll understand Alzheimer's disease and some of the other diseases, the genetic diseases of the brain. And that's good, that's very hard. And I think those people and the rest, I think you should go to the other side of the conference and see where they're at, because I think we're going to get there, just like with cancer. I think that, the, and yes, our tools will be used, but our tools are not going to directly solve those problems. Over there, please. Thank you. As we are talking about both uh, AI and the uh, optimization today, and so I want to talk about something about the neural network and in the deep learning. And we know that the AI scientists nowadays are trying to develop more and more complex new, uh, networks. So I wonder if uh, there are possibilities that they underestimate the role of the optimizers. Because I know that when they face some problems and get some unsatisfactory results, they tend to change the parameters and uh, change the structure of the networks, but rather than just uh, rather than thinking about the optimization part, and most of them just stick to uh, one kind of op uh, optimizer, like the Atom, which is developed based on Estorov's uh, 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 moment momentum gradient descent theory. So I wonder, do you have any opinions about this? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, also, in my opinion, the situation with all these um, uh, experiments with a neural network and, and uh, so on, so mostly this is the empirical uh, activity. So it, we cannot prove too much about uh, guarantee the results. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, but this is the, the modern style. So the things which you can see in the literature is the published things. So they are just the story of successes, successful story. And nobody knows uh, how many failures do we have because actually now there are, I would say, millions of people they are doing all these experiments. And again, so what, what is not. Uh, um, 
not very good. So if you have some, let me say, stable success, so people prefer not to publish the result, but just to create a startup and, and commercialize uh, so this thing. Therefore, so the picture which we have now from the literature is very fuzzy and uh, not uh, reliable. And for me, again, so the, uh, we will indeed uh, advance theoretically with all this uh, activity, neural networks, only when we will have convex problems for which we can have the theoretical guarantee and then so we can say so this is done and we can move forward. Before that, all of that is just, uh, I don't know, the experiments which uh, cannot explain too much. The problem is that you can't guarantee anything. So you have very successful series of experiments. After that, you change a little bit your database, and it doesn't work at all. And what to do to tune parameters or, uh, I don't know, to increase the depth or whatever, I don't know. As I said, in my opinion, for whatever it is worth your own, success of neural nets, uh, deep learning and things like this, is engineering achievement. What I personally know about optimization doesn't explain uh, why, in spite of the fact that gradient algorithms are applied there, why, why, why it works, I don't know. I'm not saying that they do not work. Uh, but okay, for years now I am trying to, to uh, convince people to carry out very simple experiment. So you take uh, 256 times 256 images, just two, one or zero in every picture. Then you say that when the number of ones is odd, this is men. And when the number of ones is uh, zero, it is women. Uh, woman. Of course, you can train uh, that there is a net uh, which will 100% uh, recognize those images. And the question is whether existing uh, ways of training neural nets will be able to recognize uh, the, those formal uh, men and women or not. As, as well as they recognize the, the actual uh, men and women. That's something which uh, you can carry out experiment. Uh, I cannot, but, but because I don't have no idea what uh, are those techniques for training neural nets, and uh, also I'm not uh, very interested uh, personally in this. But this is an experiment. You can carry out it. And or the, the, the existing training techniques will train the net, or they will not. If they will train the net, there is something which we, we can speak about whether mathematics can help or not. If they cannot, there is nothing to do because uh, format, because uh, if you want, uh, if it not always those techniques works, uh, and, but they indeed are capable to decide on biological pictures where, where the, there is man and where the, there is wo woman, then uh, to, to, to explain it scientifically, mathematically, you sh should start with this definition of what is a man and what is a woman in picture. And this is something we, we, which you cannot do if you know. knew the definition, most probably could uh, write down a code which decides. This is my opinion. Again, that this is skeptical. I believe that um, the, 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 the say in contrast uh, in uh, compressive sensing, which has, in my opinion, is a great achievement of the last decade or two, and it has clear mathematical origin. I believe that, uh, that again, the fact that this guy knows how, how to decide who is man, who is woman, uh, that this, I believe, uh, again, uh, I believe that not the same as the, the, the truth, by far. Okay, I believe that this is engineering achievement. Are there any other questions? Please.
uh, this question is for, uh, for, for Professor Michael Jordan. As we know, we you found a great uh, a new a, a new field uh, from the statistical uh, control theory, from the perspective of marketing design, design. Can we need a new field, machine uh, information design or action design to the replicas? Replicas. 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 Information design or action design. Last word on understanding. Maybe go slowly on that. M maybe we, we can do a perfect Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, mechanism design, just to, uh, to set, you know, that, that's really an inverse problem. So it's the inverse of game theory. And so game theory was more of a descriptive discipline and more of a mathematical discipline saying I set up some rules and, and I observe some behavior. And then von Neumann and others showed you got interesting behavior in Nash yeah. and the economists have used it. Uh, mechanism design is really an engineering topic. It's the inverse of that saying here's a behavior I'd like to see in the world. What game do I design such that when the players play that game that, that behavior will arrive, okay, arise. Um, I personally think it's far underexploited outside of the narrow branch of auction theory in, in, in economics. And so um, I think I'm giving a talk tomorrow in which I'll talk a bit about this. There's a whole range of mechanisms that have not been explored much in contract theory, auction theory, matching markets, and market design. Um, and the tools are often those of optimization under the hood at the bottom, as is most things. Linear algebra and optimization is everywhere. But it also brings in notions of incentives. Yeah. And so incentives are critical. If I don't set up incentives in a system, it'll break apart. The system just won't work. People won't play the game. They'll walk away from it or they'll try to cheat and they'll send in fake data and they will make a, you know, a mess of the problem. And I think that's just, we don't have enough realization of the importance of designing adaptive universally adaptive incentive systems. We can design algorithms, but we don't think about it nearly enough. Um, and I think, in fact, a lot of information technology was just bottom-up technology, build things and hopefully it'll work, um, or criticizing it after the fact that we should regulate it because it's causing troubles. And there's this thing in the middle called mechanism design, which says, what if we set up the right incentives so that, you know, it, it's more in the company's interest to behave better or more in the individual's interest to not cheat and lie and steal uh, that will help to build, build better society. So that's a longer topic. I'm glad you asked. But um, I, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a branch. Just like in mathematics, uh, eventually we gave rise to people that more, worked closer to problems in the modern world. In economics, same thing. You have a lot of people that are just studying the economy, doing macroeconomics. But there's a small subset of them who know how to design incentive compatible mechanisms and even a smaller subset who, who know how to do that with data and with optimization algorithms. And, and I think in the next 20, 30 years, I hope the young people in the room are paying attention, that that's the field that's going to give rise to some of the actual technology that we really find we want to deploy in the real world. So it's sort of opti optimization is the computational mechanism we use most. We don't use complexity theory for computer science. Hardly at all. We use optimization theory and we use Arcadi's complexity theory. Uh, I think if we combine that with mechanism design, and let me also add in the 40s and 50s, the antecedents of all of us were people like Ken Arrow or people like Kolmogorov um, and people like David Blackwell. And, and these were mathematicians, Norbert Wiener, mathematicians who were studying problems in economics together with statistics, together with computer science. And somehow the fields all broke apart and it became separated. And to solve modern problems, I think they have to come back together. Yeah, thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, I have a question from, actually just received from my phone, one of my students. And, and they saw the uh, live cast and he want me to ask a question on behalf of undergraduate students. If they want to choose optimization as their research area, what should they do to prepare for the future study? Like in the uh, field of undergraduate students, what kind of subjects they should to take? 
because when I when I teaching optimization, I normally I found my student my student they lack of necessary knowledge to understand to have a deep understanding on optimization theory. So, do you have any suggestions for undergraduate students if they want to choose optimization as their research area? Thank you. I believe the answer is easy. Linear algebra, including matrices uh, and things like uh, uh, variational characterization of eigenvalues, primary symmetric matrices, no elements of real analysis, closed, uh, closeness, uh, open set, closed set, compactness. No. The, 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 this was, and also, of course, calculus, uh, derivatives, differentials, Taylor expansions. I believe this is nearly it. Yeah. <coughs> I, I agree with Arkady, actually. So this is basically the basic uh, knowledge of analysis. But in, in my experience, so for uh, many students, uh, it is difficult to compute derivatives, strangely enough. Derivatives of uh, function of several variables. For example, if you ask uh, students to compute the derivative of determinant of a matrix as, as elements, they, they cannot, just because they know the rules, uh, simple rules to compute from school derivatives, but they not, are not trained to apply definition directly. Okay, and this is important because for me engineers, they should be able to compute derivatives. It's just the basic operation, basic analysis. I agree with Yuri, and from my personal teaching experience, no, I nearly never teach undergraduates, but nevertheless, what uh, the, the deficiency, frequent deficiency, is lack of basic mathematical culture. Let me explain what I mean. Somebody says that two by two is five. This is not lack of culture. This is just miscalculation. But if somebody says that two by two is a triangle, then this is indication of lack of mathematical culture because we are supposed to know uh, uh, at any time that the pro product of two numbers is a number, not a triangle. Uh, so that this is, again, that the, if they know calculus rules mechanically, this is not enough. They should understand what they are computing. And in a rare situation, but there are situations like differentiation of determinant that should apply the definition, and not just the rules. If the rules, they will die. I just want to add one thing. Tell your undergraduate students not to get worried if they take the course in the mathematics department and it seems totally useless and theoretical and abstract and has no applications. And I have a story here. I, in my sophomore year, I transferred from electrical engineering to engineering science because it sound, I, I wanted to take more physics. And they had me take linear algebra uh, in my sophomore year and I dropped engineering science. I moved back to electrical engineering because I was forced to take linear algebra and I saw it as one of the most useful theoretical abstract math courses I'd ever seen until I got to graduate school and it was the most useful course I'd ever taken. So it, maybe you should teach these in engineering, but if your students have to take them in mathematics, don't get discouraged by that. It's, uh, the mathematicians like to emphasize how useless this stuff is. And actually there's one other example. When I had to learn more number theory for cryptography, I got, a, I think one of the books I got said, number theory is the purest of pure mathematics with absolutely no practical applications. The mathematicians revel in this. And yet there was a footnote there that the, wor the work in writing the book had been supported by the U.S. Air Force under the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And I thought, if this person only knew who was really supporting his research, it was probably the American code-breaking and code-making uh, uh, agency. So that's the other advice I'd give your undergraduates is take mathematics and don't be worried if it seems abstract to abstract. I fully agree with what was just said. And uh, I would say that, that there is no such thing as uh, useless knowledge. 
If you don't know something, you never will be able to apply it because you do not know. If you know something, then on the span of your life, perhaps you could utilize this knowledge for the problems you are interested in. So that the more math I am speaking about, math, undergraduates will take the better, in my opinion. There was something magical that m must have happened in, in, in Russia or in the Soviet Union at the time in the 50s and 60s. Um, because many, many people came out of Russia uh, to lead in areas like stochastic processes, probability, optimization, uh, dynamical systems, and so on. And I just wondered if you have any, if, if you agree that there was something magical about the era, and, and maybe for those of us who are thinking about designing systems, educational systems, and, and academic systems in countries where we have, you know, real problems right now. We're not training people very well and all. Uh, is there something we should uh, take away from that experience, uh, or was it just chance? I, I don't think it was Hungary. just chance, and maybe Arkady could, make, could speak to this, since, and, and actually Yuri, since they were both educated in the Soviet Union. I am I, asking, I, yes. I think, I think the Soviet Union valued mathematics in a way that the West did not. But I want to dig into that a little bit, yeah. You know, why did they do, or how did they do it, you know, how did they value it, and how did that, you know, encourage what really happened? In addition to Russia, I think we should give a lot of credit to Hungary and Romania. You know, von Neumann came from Hungary, many others, you know. I don't know exactly, I was wondering if there's a DNA or whether there's water, <laughs> what it is. I understand both Yuri and me graduated from uh, specialized schools. Yes, Yura, uh, with uh, emphasis on math. And uh, in my opinion, that, that this is uh, very easy to explain. First of all, the school system in Russia used to be and still is not just getting a fun. It was indeed hard work. That's one story. Another story, when you are doing math, uh, that there, is no, there are no uh, political limitations. Subject. So many people just selected this area of activity because it was free of <coughs> guiding role of Communist Party. Yeah, this is my explanation. And there was also another thing uh, which uh, was specific for the Soviet Union. Uh, that the life conditions in the, so in the Soviet Union were by far not homogeneous. Life in Moscow was much better than in a small town somewhere in province. As a result, talented people tried to go to Moscow, to some, what's called now St. Petersburg, to other big cities. As a result, in my opinion, that now mathematical uh, and the mechanical department of Moscow Uni University, uh, our teachers, the collection of our teachers was much stronger than uh, that, that this is again, that, that this is selection which is unnatural. But nevertheless, it was much stronger than uh, in other, uh, any other place which I know. So that the, perhaps the total outcome of Soviet mathematics was uh, uh, lower than, than in the United States, in France, in England, but it was very, the, the, there were singularities. And if you are lucky to live in such a singularity as me as Yuri, you had absolutely fantastic opportunities to learn some. Maybe I can add a couple of words. So for me, actually, one of the main reasons is the extremely high concentration of the brains in the same place. Because the Soviet Union at that time was 300 million people, and all best brains, almost all, because there are Kiev and Leningrad at that time, but 90% of the brain were concentrated at the same place. And for optimization, this means that actually just in Moscow, so we had, uh, in my opinion, five different optimization schools, 
and you can visit them just by public transport in one day, meet several guys, discuss it, and seminars, and all things like that. In the United States, of course, you have much more or maybe talented people, but they're very far uh, one from another, and you meet them only on the conferences, so it's a rare event. There it was just the daily life, and this was really very, very... Um, uh, important. I think uh, China could repeat something like that because, for example, the, uh, the uh, cities like Shanghai, so also this is uh, 26 million, so they could achieve uh, kind of uh, high concentration. Yeah, but uh, in all other countries, I simply don't, don't see uh, any possibility. Right, I, I think we've reached the end of our time. We have limited time constraint, as we talked about earlier. Um, I want to thank uh, very much uh, all of the panel. I appreciate you coming here and participating in this event to honor our laureates. And I really want to give a round of thanks, not just for their participation on the panel, but for their really decades of inspired work that have, uh, that have changed all of our lives. So Arkady and Yuri, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. This is the panel. Uh, there's a award ceremony tomorrow, and I hope to see many of you there. And, uh, and if not, see you next year. <laughs>